Um, I don't have any slides. I don't play the piano, except heart and soul with my granddaughter. I, I don't know what to do with a clicker. I can barely hold a stand-up microphone. I'm a modified limited hangout hipster. <laughs> and I'm old, so I'm sitting here, and all I do is tell stories. And my story today begins in 1993, when maybe half of this room were kids. And I was embarking on my first book, which was about the President of the United States then, Bill Clinton. I was in Arkansas. It was spring. Uh, spring comes early in Arkansas. It was early March. And I drove from Little Rock up what was called the Pig Trail, up to Fayetteville, and then down to Hope, Arkansas, where Bill Clinton was born. There was one motel on the edge of town, a Super 8. And the night clerk there who checked me in said that she was related to Bill Clinton. Uh, she was his great aunt, she said. Now, half of Hope, Arkansas said they were related to Bill Clinton, and the other half probably really was. Uh, but in any case, uh, this was a valuable first contact. And because it was March and the mimosa trees were blooming, and because I'm a pathetic asthmatic with allergies to everything, I could barely speak. And this great aunt of Bill Clinton felt sorry for me, so she said, Dave, come on over to my house tonight, and I'll give you a magic potion that'll clear your nose. So I thought I'll try anything, and I went over to her house in Hope, and she gave me this potion, and it made me sicker. Um, <laughs> But while we were talking, she said, you know, up in my attic, I have a box with all of Billy Clinton's Mamaw's effects. Mamaw in the South is grandmother. So my heart started pounding, and she went up to the attic and brought back this box and opened it up. And the first thing I saw was stationery that said Georgetown University. Bill Clinton went to Georgetown University. This was a box full of letters that he had written. Uh, to his grandmother. And it was at that moment, working on my first book, that I realized that I could do it. People ask me all the time, because I've been writing nonfiction for newspapers and books for 40 years, you know, what the future is of newspapers and of books. And my answer is that the platforms inevitably are going to change. Perhaps not in my lifetime, but in most of your lifetimes, Newspapers will no longer exist at all the way they do today. Um, and I'm not even sure about books. And there's, that's inevitable, nothing that can be done about it. And I might not like it, because I like to read the newspaper in the bathroom, but you have to accept it. <laughs> but two things should not and will not, I hope, change. And the first is stories. There is a human need for stories that goes back to the first cavemen. Um, and has run through all of our humanity and will exist forever. And whatever platform is used is one thing, it doesn't matter as long as we can use stories to explain ourselves and understand ourselves. And the second thing that has to exist is the search for truth. And here I'm not talking about superficial certainties, as Jordan explained so brilliantly uh, earlier today. I'm not talking about people going on television and blabbing about what they know is to be the truth and that everyone else is wrong. I'm not talking about people blogging in their bedrooms about what they know to be the truth. I'm talking about going out and searching to try to find the truth. At the end of that first book about Bill Clinton, the last three months of that were among the most painful in my life. I just didn't know how to finish the book because it was my first biography. I had the material, I'd never get writer's block. But the problem was, I thought I had to decide, well, which is it about Bill Clinton? Is he good or bad? I thought that was my duty as a biographer to explain that aspect of him. Was he the great Bill Clinton who was uh, the first professor at the University of Arkansas to actually help the first wave of black students there who called him Boy Wonder because they were all flunking out until he came and started tutoring them and really caring about them? Or it must be the Bill Clinton that we know in so many other ways could be disappointing. And I couldn't resolve that until one day the obvious became obvious to me, which is that he was both, that you didn't have to resolve it. But in fact, the truth is that, well, not just uncertainty, but the contradictions that exist in all of us. Every single person in this room knows 
that there are parts of what they think they believe, that there's also a seed of refutation in their head. And we all know that we have these contradictions living out throughout our lives. Bill Clinton was just an exaggeration of all of those. My whole search for truth is based on four legs of a chair or bench. The first one is go there, wherever there is. The second one is find the documents, the contemporaneous documents, whether letters or archives of any sort. The third one is talk to as many people as I can, do interviews, find oral interviews as well. And the fourth one is look for what's not there. Look for what is not the conventional wisdom. Try to find something beyond what everybody has already repeated. When you go to the web, you find what's already there. You have to actually go out into the world to find things that aren't already part of the conventional wisdom. So go there for me. Uh, and after I finished the Clinton book, I decided to do the exact opposite and find the opposite archetype and wrote a book about Vince Lombardi, the football coach up in Green Bay. And so I had to turn to my wife and utter the immortal loving words, how would you like to move to Green Bay for the winter? <laughs> I'm not going to talk about Vince Lombardi beyond that, but I can say that going to Green Bay was essential for doing that book. To write about the, it's not a really a book about football, but the climax of football of Vince Lombardi was something called the Ice Bowl on New Year's Eve 1970. I can't even remember anymore which year it was, 1967. And it was 13 below zero, and I had to endure that. Of course, she did that in Madison without even trying this winter. Um, but I had to move up to Green Bay from Washington, D.C. to endure that, to have the feel for that moment. But going there in every one of my books has taken me to places I could never write about without feeling it. Um, and so writing a biography of Barack Obama took me all over the world and to Indonesia on what was then the longest non-stop flight in the world from Newark Airport to Singapore and then down to Jakarta. And of course, while I was in Jakarta, I had many people to interview. We had documents to find and translate from Bahasa Indonesia uh, to English. But it was the, just a sensibility that was the most important thing that isn't even really quite in my book, but infuses everything in it. And that was, Barack Obama moved to, to uh, Jakarta when he was six, with his mother and a stepfather. He came without money. He wasn't one of those English boys who went to the uh, international school. He was in this little neighborhood, Mentan Dalam, with narrow alleys and street vendors and smells and sounds of the mosque and, and just everything about it. Imagine what that would have been like. And it was only when I went there and walked those same narrow alleyways and heard the street vendors selling their various exotic foods and saw the boys playing in the alleys and the streets that what was obvious overwhelmed me in a way that infused everything I wrote, whether today I agree with Barack Obama about something, strongly disagree about others, but I understand it from that deepness of thinking about a six-year-old boy in that place, in those alleys, playing, not knowing the language, learning the language fluently, going to the regular public schools, not to the international school, dealing with all the kids, everything about him. That little boy going from there to the White House explained everything about, me, about him to me by going there. I also try to look for what's not there. And in, in the book that struck me the most about that was this notion that I have that people are written out of history, and it's my job to write them back in. I wrote a book about the 1960 Rome Olympics. It was, again, it wasn't really about sports, although I love sports, and the, the characters at those Olympics are immortal. Cassius Clay, who became Muhammad Ali, um, Rayford Johnson, the greatest athlete in the world, the decathlete. Uh, Bebe Bekila, the first black African to win a gold medal, running barefoot through the streets of Rome. He was an Ethiopian. He was running through a city that had conquered and, and destroyed his country with mustard gas only 25 years earlier, running barefoot through this imperial city of Rome and winning. 
all of these amazing characters. But the ones that stuck with me the most were a group of black women from Tennessee State University in East Nashville, in Nashville, Tennessee, the Tiger Bells. The Tiger Bells coach didn't have his own office. He had to share an office with his wife, who was the postmistress of the, of the school. They didn't have their own track. They had to run on the football track, which had pop marks all over it, or in a farm field full of places where they could break their ankles. They didn't have any competition. This was before the era of Title IX, and it was considered unladylike to, to be a, in track. The only schools that had track and field were three small black colleges in the South. They had to drive through the South. This is 1960, 59, 60, 61, that period. They couldn't stop. They were afraid to stop to get gas. When, when the young women had to stop, they'd say it's time to hit the fields. They'd go in two clunky station wagons. And out of that group, out of the Tennessee State Tiger Bells, came the greatest track and field team in world history, winning more gold medals, winning more championships than any group before them. And so any woman in this room today who went on to be in high school sports of any sort or any type of sports where women could participate today owes so much to those people who were written out of history, the Tennessee State Tiger Bells. Go there, try to find the truth, not a superficial truth, also involves being truthful with the people you're dealing with. When I was writing a story about the Vietnam War, half of which takes place here in Madison, it's about an anti-war protest at the university and a battle in Vietnam happening on the same two days of October 1967. A protest against Dow Chemical Company, makers of napalm and Agent Orange. One of the soldiers I wrote about died yesterday of a bladder cancer which was caused by the Agent Orange which the students were protesting at the University of Wisconsin. In any case, one of the central characters in that book was a lieutenant who was a commander of a company in Vietnam of the battle that I write about. This was a battle where 140 men went out into the jungle on what was called a search and destroy mission. 60 got killed and 60 wounded out of that 140. It was at a time when the US government was saying that simply by going out on search and destroys will win this war through battles of attrition. It was a lie. The commander of the company that was destroyed ever since that battle had been hiding up in the hills of Colorado afraid to deal with the world because he had fought valiantly that day, but he was afraid that someone would say, you're responsible for the death of my son or my husband or my loved one. I was trying to reach him. I knew he was key to the story. He finally, after a year, agreed to talk with me. I went out to Denver, Colorado. We met in a hotel lobby. He was an old Green Beret. Turned out he'd been scouting me for an hour before he came up to me, trying to figure out whether he should talk to me or not. For some reason, he decided to. We sat down. He said, David, I will talk to you as long as you promise to be good to my boys. I said, I can't make that promise. I said, I could make that promise, and if I find things that contradict that, either I write it and I break the promise to you, or I break the promise to the truth. It's not a deal I can make. He said, no, that's not good enough. You have to promise to be good to my boys. And I repeated it. No, I can't make that promise, so you have to understand what the, the whole, the corner that puts me in, and you. He started to get up again and then he decided, he actually listened and decided to trust me. And from that moment on I said, look, I'll share everything I find with you. This is not some government secret. I'm trying to write about this very difficult battle, what really happened, and the government lied about it. Um, I don't know what, how your boys, as he called them, responded, but I'll let you know what I find. He trusted me. Uh, for a year, he'd send me all of the letters. He sent home from Vietnam. He introduced me to everybody else that I needed to find. It made all the difference in the book. 
And then at the end, he agreed to go back to Vietnam with me. We went back with him, Clark Welch, and the daughter of the battalion commander was killed in the battle. And when we were in Vietnam, after several, because I had documents, because I'd done all of the groundwork, we found the company commander of the Viet Cong's 1st Division, who was on the other side of the battle that day. Well, as it turned out, said that he, they weren't even supposed to be there, that they were starving and looking for rice, and they stayed in this one spot and heard this clunky American battalion marching around the jungle. They decided to set up an ambush. They had 1,100 men. The Americans were 140. Search and destroy. The Americans got destroyed. He said, we weren't even trying to do that. The next day, he agreed to go out to the battlefield with me and Clark Welch and our entourage. We drove out toward the Cambodian border, about 44 miles from Saigon. We, Clark Welch had a, a GPS pendant on him. I had all of the documents that showed exactly where everything went. And it was now a manioc field. We marched for about a uh, a mile through this Maniac field. Clark Welch and Vomien Tret, an American commander, a Viet Cong commander, didn't know each other's languages, were communicating together 40 years later, pointing out where they were. They had their arms around each other. Two old soldiers who had tried to kill each other 40 years earlier were together in Vietnam. Finally, I said, I think we're getting close to the battle, the site. Clark Welch had his GPS. He said, yeah, if we walk over this way, we'll be exactly where Consuelo Allen, your father, was killed trying to hide behind an anthill. So we walked that way. It was an old, it was a new rubber plantation. And it was a beautiful day in Vietnam. And the sun was dappling down through the rubber plantation. We walk into the middle of the of this plantation, and there's another anthill. It's a different anthill, but it's the same anthill. And it was that moment, as I stood there and watched Clark Welch, and Vomi Triat, and young Consuelo Allen, whose father was killed, that it sort of washed over me the greatest truth of all, which is the commonality of the human experience. Thank you very much. <laughs>